This is a Clark University podcast. The very fact that we have a genre called the coming of age narrative signals our deep, abiding interest in what happens to people going through these certain kinds of transitional periods in their life. The way a person imagines how one should respond to the challenges of growing up tells you a lot about what feels like a social problem to that writer. How is the literature imagining a way out of that? And do we buy it? Do we feel like that works? Does, is that a path forward for us? Is there at least a shred of truth there for us to build a new perspective on? Clark English professor Spencer Tricker finds coming-of-age narratives a useful vehicle to study divided loyalties in his classroom. I would define divided loyalties as never a static problem. I think that when you talk about divided loyalties, you're always talking about an active process of forces warring within yourself, warring in the world outside. It's a kind of dynamic conflict between commitments. The nature of those commitments and how passionately one feels will change over time, but I would say it's that dynamic conflict that unfolds continuously. The transition from adolescence into adulthood can serve as an example of divided loyalties. As young people try and find their place in the world, they're torn between building confidence in their identity versus appeasing others, sometimes at the expense of their sense of self. It's an experience that may be familiar to some students in Spencer's classroom. I want for them in the classroom to take the opportunity to read literature, to explore narratives where divided loyalties is the overriding theme, to think about how, in spite of all the noise that tells us how divided we are, that actually most of us do have this complex and, let's say, continuous movement within ourselves. Many of our students who find themselves in the traditional college age, maybe 18 to 22, are transitioning from childhood through adulthood. And I think that's probably taking longer right now in the wake of the pandemic. I see it as a really productive moment to think about when we look at these narratives coming of age, I try to encourage the students to think of it as competing allegiances. Deciding which of those are worth pursuing, where do the characters put their foot down and say no, where do the characters say, yes, I need to change. One of the things about that transition from childhood to adulthood that is often there in coming of age stories is the notion that you are going to relinquish what's childlike and you're going to become this thing called an adult. We never really relinquished our childhood, right? And and in fact, there are a lot of ways in which the ways we see the world as a child are um, things we should get back to. We should be as compassionate as we sometimes can be. Children are also being like, outrageously cruel. So, there's, of course, the difference between being childish and childlike, they have different connotations. I'm Melissa Hansen, a producer in Clark's communications office, and this is Challenge Change. Spencer and his students analyze contemporary literature to explore how young people navigate competing allegiances as they grow into adulthood. We just finished up with a novel by the Vietnamese-American writer Monique Trong that's entitled Bitter in the Mouth. That narrative, I think, is one that has really resonated with students when I've taught it. It came out in the last decade, and it's a narrative that's about a young woman someone aged 30 or so and is looking back on her childhood in North Carolina. It's interesting insofar as it has a protagonist that has a condition called lexical gustatory synesthesia, which is basically whenever they hear sounds, but especially words, they get a taste in their mouth. And so this narrative is a narrative about the overwhelming sensation of growing up and living through certain kinds of traumas in the process, but also being living through sensory overload. It's a novel that explores growing up in a way that I think is really interesting because by engaging the sense of taste, it really keeps us in touch with the body, just something that can't be left behind or diminished in coming of age narratives. When you grow into adulthood, there's a lot of biological changes going on, right? And there's a lot of chemical changes. And yet the coming of age narrative really encourages us to focus on the mind and just what's happening in our heads, which to some degree is 
the consequence of this biological changes. Spencer can relate divided loyalties to his childhood experiences. Divided loyalties, for me, originates with a sense of my heritage as a mixed race person, as someone that grew up abroad for part of my childhood. I was actually born in the U.S., but was raised largely in Hong Kong until I was nine, and then at that point moved to the United States, to Florida. One of the things I've noticed retrospectively, and I was reflecting on this with my students in the class, is that I didn't really start to come to a sense of myself as an Asian person until I left Hong Kong, which kind of sounds maybe counterintuitive. When I moved to the States, by contrast, I, it was a pretty severe culture shock, to be honest. I moved to like, the suburbs of Florida. And at that point, I started to be recognized by other students as an Asian person that went to a primarily white Catholic school. I always found myself most at ease in places where I could look around a room and see a lot of cultural difference. We see a lot of pageantry around the idea that we are a, a happy and harmonious multicultural society. I found myself over the years recruited into this kind of somewhat manipulative tactic of trying to harness cultural diversity to mask over long-standing social problems, whether they be racism, whether they be homophobia, whether they be classism. Beyond the coming-of-age narrative, it's instinct to think of divided loyalties in the political sphere. It's common to hear political pundits suggesting America is more divided than ever. For Spencer, who studies the 19th century, there's a meaningful comparison between division in contemporary America versus the state of the country in the 1800s. Studying the 19th century allows students to think comparatively about the nature of really deep divisions that go back a long way and how they differ from today's world. They also help them understand how we got to this place of having quite a community in spite of a lot of kinds of like white supremacist immigration laws, despite Jim Crow, and despite a whole range of obstacles to that kind of mixed society. We have heard in recent times the notion that we are headed towards some kind of new civil war or some recapitulation of something like that. And I think on the one hand, teaching students about the nature of those political divides can be heartening because you see that for all of the sense of difference now, it was quite a bit worse, I think, back then. In a world of divided loyalties, how do people reach a mutual agreement? Even if we are inclined to identify ourselves as progressive or conservative, even in terms of our regional attachments, the Northeastern or Southern or something like that, even if we stake those flags, they're not usually stuck in the same place for too long. And they shift and they move. And people can understand ways to, to treat others with greater respect, but also understand what is the nature of the kind of ideals that they have that they need to stay true to. I think they're coming into the classroom with a kind of set of questions and, a, and an exposure to social justice that was not what I remember coming into college with. They are much more cognizant of at least the basics of certain ideas. Intersectionality, the importance of thinking about injustice as a multi-factored, multivalent issue, especially as it pertains to people that find themselves at the intersection of subordinated social groups. That's coming from some of the, the marches for social justice, the BLM movement, March for Our Lives, all kinds of things that have been galvanized by social media depending on what side of the spectrum they find themselves on politically. I think they do feel that things are really tense. It's very hard to broach subjects. It's very hard to have a conversation about anything. It's an opportunity, as I see it, for everyone, myself included, to think about what are the things that we can't compromise on? What are the things that might constitute a worthy compromise? Because that's going to need to happen as well in this world for us to make productive changes, for people to just have sustainable lives, to find stability and happiness. Spencer is working on a book project about trans-Pacific migration from Asia to the United States, highlighting cosmopolitanism and the importance of advocating for one's community. Clark Communications intern Brenna Moore took a recorder to a cappella rehearsal on Wednesday night. She wanted to discover which coming-of-age tales made the biggest impact on her peers. What is your favorite coming-of-age book or movie? I think in recent years, Booksmart is absolutely my favorite. 
I was definitely one of like the nerdy kids in high school and so I feel like the not going to parties, not like those moments that show up in the movie I, I really resonated with and then kind of seeing the chaos that ensues and I just really loved the relationship and the dynamics between those two characters. Ooh, a coming of age book or movie. I heavily made like the Percy Jackson books and like the Heroes of Olympus books my entire personality. <laughs> like as I, as they grew up in the stories, I felt like I was growing up with them because I'm also a slow reader. So it took me a really long time to read all of them. <laughs> so I don't know. I just felt like that's such a significant part, especially it's just like they're trying to navigate the world and like monsters, allegories for real life, I guess. Um, I would probably have to say Freaky Friday, um, and the original Lindsay Lohan version, of course. Why? Well, it's probably one of the first coming-of-age movies I ever really watched, and so it really set the tone for me. In terms of growing up and developing uh, my adolescent brain, um, I also think it paralleled the relationship that I had with my mom, so it was kind of the first window into, oh, I'm, maybe I'm not alone in this. Have you ever felt like a character in a coming-of-age book movie? Definitely. My junior year, I studied abroad in London, um, and I really think that there's no better like definition of a main character moment because it was just me sort of taking on this new place and really kind of discovering myself and and growing and learning about how I live on my own in a foreign country and exploring and living and like every moment standing in the sun I was like oh this is this is my moment to shine and it was kind of cheesy but it was really really fun and I feel like that encapsulates it well. Oftentimes for me they come in they come in moments of high emotion. This past New Year's Eve, I made it a goal to feel like the main character more often. Um, and um, because I think those moments are really, really cool and should be really treasured. So I have a main character playlist that I play, that I'm like, this is, this is everything. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, of course. You just heard from current students, Melanie Berman, Hannah Friend, and Janelle Payumo. To learn more about English at Clark, visit clarku.edu slash English. Challenge Change is produced by Andrew Hart and Melissa Hansen for Clark University. A special thanks to Brenna for her help with this episode. Find other episodes wherever you listen to podcasts. One, two, three. Clark! <laughs>